Welcome to My Therapist Says. During today's broadcast, I'll be your host and moderator as we present Adolescence, a Parent's Guide to Preparation, Survival, and Thriving. Dr. Joe Price, an exceptional parent, San Diego State University professor and researcher, is today's presenter. Dr. Price is a distinguished developmental scientist and professor in the Department of Psychology at San Diego State University and a member of the Joint Doctoral Training Program in Clinical Psychology at San Diego State University and the University of California, San Diego. He's also a research scientist at the Child and Adolescent Services Research Center at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. Dr. Price's recent research and publications focus on the developmental sequel of the experiences associated with early maltreatment and the implementation of evidence-based interventions for child behavior problems in the child welfare systems of care. Now, today's event takes place before a live audience and live streaming while offering practical biblical solutions. It's like having your own Christian doctor within the comforts of your living room. I hope you will sit back, relax, and take in these life-changing insights. Please join me as we connect with a live audience and My Therapist Says. Well, welcome again to My Therapist Says, and I want to welcome Dr. Joe Price, and thank you, sir, for being with us this evening, and we welcome you. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Joe Price? Good evening. Good to see everybody. Am I on? There we go. Good. Good to see everybody. Um, I assume everybody here has an adolescent or is going to have an adolescent. Um, and my guess is all of you have been adolescents. Am I right? Okay, good. So at least we have all that in common when we're thinking about adolescence. Tonight what I want to do in this opening part, uh, to talk about preparation, how to thrive, how to survive adolescence, is I want to give you an overview of some of the changes that are happening and some of the things that we can do as parents in the midst of those changes. And it's really important that we understand those changes because they help us understand our adolescents and what they're going through. And that helps us to be able to prepare, survive, and actually thrive for this period. So anyway, the first uh, slides I want to show you is we have three daughters, uh, Kelsey, Kylie, and Nikki. And in this shot, they were 16, 14, and 12. So we went through the adolescent period. All three of them now are married. Um, and uh, Two of them have their master's degree, and one is in seminary, and she was just hired as a student ministry pastor. And so we have the three here. Then we have, as we go through the slides, we see kind of what adolescence looks like. If you look at the next slide, um, kind of the goofiness of adolescence. <laughs> and then the final one, I asked Nikki, Nikki, I'm going to take a picture of this beautiful setting. Uh, it's called American Basin in Colorado. It's this loop, uh, four-wheel drive loop. And I turn around, get ready to take the picture, and there is Nikki. This is the one who is now in seminary and was hired to be a student <laughs> ministries pastor. <laughs> she just got back from a camp and, and backpack trip with her youth. Um, so anyway, people do survive and thrive adolescence. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. There we go. So anyway, uh, Sherry and I, uh, Reverend Sherry and I raised these three girls, so we have experience in dealing with adolescence. Both Sherry and I had been youth directors at one time in our lives, uh, working with adolescents. Um, but now what I want to do is share with you some of the changes that go through adolescents, uh, that adolescents actually go through. So if you look at your handout, you're going to see one of the pages, and it says, what's happening during adolescence? Change, change, change. And so what we see are five areas that I'm going to talk about. We're going to talk about biological changes. We're going to talk about changes in the brain. We're going to talk about changes in thinking. And we're going to talk about changes in self-concept and then finally social relationships. So let's look at each of these changes as we go through this. So first of all, let's look at the biological changes that are happening within the body. And what you're going to see as we look at this is what's called the endocrine system. And the endocrine system is the slow communication system in the body. This is the hormonal system uh, within our bodies that 
control so many different functions within our bodies. And what happens during adolescence is this. A part of the brain that's called the hypothalamus is regulating and monitoring levels of, what, of a hormone called leptin, which comes out of fat content and fat cells. So as our children are gaining more and more fat in their bodies, more and more leptin is being released. When there's a certain level that's reached, the hypothalamus now triggers a cascade of hormonal changes through the body. That affects the thyroid gland. If you look at your handout, it affects the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the adrenal glands, the gonads, uh, sex organs. And each of these have different hormones that are being released. This is a slow process. So this particular change that's taking place occurs about a year before you see any changes and before your adolescents see any changes. Okay? So a year before, these changes are taking place. Okay? And it's starting this slow cascade. And as a result of this, we have two major phenomena that we're going to talk about. The first one is called puberty. Okay? And puberty is a time where all these changes are resulting in two things, primary and secondary sex characteristics. Uh, puberty comes from the Latin, which means pubercere, which means hairy or to ripen, okay? So you can think of your kids as getting hairy and ripening in terms of adolescence, okay? Um, primary, secondary, primary sex characteristics are the parts of the body that are directly involved in reproduction. So girls um, will have their first menstrual cycle um, and their first menstrual period about age 12 and a half. They can as early before age 11, but that's a little rare. Uh, and by the age of 14, most girls have had their menstrual cycle. They're producing eggs uh, and those are going through starting a regular cycle. For boys, spermarchy is a production of sperm that, that starts about age 12. So age 12 is seventh grade for most kids. Okay, so we're starting to see these changes at age in the seventh grade for kids. Uh, for females, we have, uh, in terms of what are called secondary sex characteristics, now these are body characteristics that aren't directly involved in reproduction, but they indicate um, sexual advancement, sexual maturity. So for girls, breast development between 8 and 13. Okay. Uh, for boys, their voices are going to lower between 11 and 15. And for girls, new hair, pubic hair between 10 and 15, boys 8 and 14. Um, and so we start to see some of these changes that are taking place. And girls are ahead of boys, about a year in terms of these changes. Um, so that's puberty. The other thing that we start to see is the growth spurt. We start to see changes in the body and the growth spurt. This is where we start to see changes in, in bone length and density. Fingers, now notice this sequence. Fingers, feet, then arms and legs, then torso. So hands get bigger before the rest of their bodies. So that time in development when they seem kind of awkward and lanky, they are. All right, and noses and ears go before the rest of the face. So they kind of start looking a little strange. Now, kids can become anxious about these changes because they're kind of concerned, wait a minute, if I'm growing these huge hands and feet, what am I going to look like eventually? <laughs> so there's some anxiety about these kinds of changes. They're gonna gain weight, they're gonna gain height. For girls, this height spurt is between 10 and 14. For boys, it's between 12 and 16. Uh, in terms of height velocity, that means how much is really happening. For girls, it's about 3.5 inches per year can be, and for boys, about 4.1. So as a result of that, and girls being ahead, you can see in your handout that girls can actually be taller than boys uh, for a period of time, particularly in the 7th and 8th grade. Girls seem to be a little bit of an advantage at that time in development and may take advantage of that. So, some additional physical changes that are happening. The torso continues to grow, uh, triple in weight and size. The lungs will triple in weight and size. Uh, breathing rate is actually going to decrease. So you notice as your kids are going through adolescence, their breathing rate slows. So does their heart rate 
because their heart is getting bigger, their lungs are getting bigger, and it doesn't have to work as hard, okay? Um, physical endurance is really going to increase during this time, so they can start cross-country at school, more kinds of endurance sports. The hormones are gonna change, are gonna cause their skin to get oily, to sweat, to start to smell, and guess what? At this time in development, you may not have to encourage them to take a shower, okay? They may do it on their own, right? Now, you may still have to, but what will happen is if they go to school and they don't smell very good, guess what their peers are going to do? They're going to let them know. Yep, they're going to let them know. So you may not have that problem. And then eyes change. They actually start to elongate. And so your child may not, need, may not have glasses, but they may need them as they move into adolescence. So what are the things some parents can do because of these biological changes? Communicate accurate information. Kids want accurate information about what's happening to their bodies. And guess who they want it from? They'd rather have it from you than anybody else. When you look at surveys, kids would rather have that information from their parents than teachers or anybody else. And communicate love and acceptance as they go through those changes. When they get big hands, when they get big feet, they're still loved. They're still cared for. And we communicate that as parents to them, that regardless of the changes, we love them. And the other thing we do is discourage other family members, might be siblings, might be grandparents, from making fun of kids or pointing out features and going, oh my gosh, look at those hands, they're huge. How do you carry them around, okay? <laughs> kids feel embarrassed. They feel awkward at that time in development. So those are some things that we can do as parents to help them during that transition. Now, let's look at brain development. With the brain, we have several different changes that are happening. And if you look at your uh, diagram of the brain, you're gonna see uh, a little more detail than probably that you want to know about. But here's what we have in terms of the brain. If we move to the next slide, you're gonna see kind of detail the different regions of the brain. What you see is what's called the limbic system. It's in the middle of the brain. It's where emotions are controlled. That part of the brain is finished development at about age 17. The frontal cortex, which is in this front region, planning, executive functioning, thinking about consequences, doesn't finish development until age 24, 25. So what that means is this. Kids' emotions can overwhelm their thinking. Their emotional urges, their impulses can short-circuit their thinking. Okay? Now, for you and I as parents, we have our frontal cortex that can tell us, no, we shouldn't do that, uh, I need to wait to do that, and for kids, they're going to be more impulsive as a result of that. And so we as parents, there's some things that we can do, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, related to that, what we also find in the limbic system is what's called the reward system of the brain. This is the part of the brain that brings pleasure. When we experience something that's enjoyable, exciting, it releases dopamine. Guess what? This part of the brain develops before, finishes development, before the rest of the brain that says, oh, wait a minute, maybe we ought to wait on that reward. Maybe we ought to delay gratification. Maybe we don't need that right now. That reward system, because it's developed so early, makes adolescents more susceptible to kind of excitement, to thrill-seeking, to drugs. Drugs have more of an impact on adolescents than adults because this reward system is very well developed. But the frontal cortex, you'll see there's kind of a network that goes to the frontal cortex. That's developing between that 17 to 24 age range. When eventually, as early adults, that part of the brain is gonna say, no, wait a minute, you don't need that right now. Or no, gosh, you know, you take that drug, it's gonna have this negative impact on you. It's gonna affect you, okay? That part of the brain comes later in terms of development, right? So that's another change that's happening. And then finally, something that's going on in the brain called neural pruning. Between ages one and three, our brain produces way more connections than it's ever gonna need. And then starting at about age 11, the brain starts eliminating those unused connections. And so what you see in this diagram is where the yellow and the red are, are lots of connections. And as they get older, you start to see more blue and purple. That means those connections are getting less dense. They're being eliminated. What happens then 
is it starts to hardwire learning and it makes our brains more efficient and it speeds up processing of information. So they can handle more difficult and challenging information as the brain goes through this pruning process. And pruning is finished early adulthood, okay? Um, and so it starts around age 11 and it's finished 18, 19, 20 years of age when that pruning process starts. Now, the result, like I said, is hardwiring of learning. If that learning has been math and science and God's word, that's what gets hardwired. If it's video games, that's what gets hardwired, okay? So what our kids are doing in elementary school can have a long-term impact, what they learn. All those connections that are laid down in childhood, they help them learn facts and information. It's amazing how much information elementary school kids can learn, how much just raw facts. That's because of all those extra connections in the brain. They start to get hardwired. It might be a musical instrument, it might be a sport. And so it's important we as parents think, what is it I want my kids to be learning during childhood, during adolescence? So what is it that we as parents need to be doing because of these brain changes? First of all, provide opportunities for all kinds of learning. Opportunities to learn academics, opportunities to learn music, sports, to learn about God's word, to learn morals and values. Because those are the kinds of things, if they learn those, that are going to get hardwired for adulthood. Okay? The second thing we can do is provide structure and guidance and boundaries for that underdeveloped frontal cortex. That part of the brain that helps to think about long-term consequences that doesn't develop until age 23, 24, 25, you and I can be there to say, no, you can't do that right now. No, there is a curfew. No, we do have boundaries and limits. You're being that part of the brain for them during adolescence. And it's important that we are that structure for kids. We still need to provide that for them. Okay, so those are some of the brain changes. Let's go to changes in thinking. What's happening in terms of their thought processing? So with these brain changes, we have changes in thinking. Improved conceptual knowledge, improved ability to think about abstractions, improved use of logic. What does that mean? They can make their arguments better with you. And that's a little frustrating because now they're using real logic. logic. You can't get away with because I said so. They want to know why. Okay? And so they have the capability to argue with you more because of that. They have the ability to imagine and deal with hypothetical situations. Well, let's, let's just, mom, dad, let's think about if I had a later curfew. What would that really be like? Okay? Or if I could drive your car instead of my car. So they bring up all these hypothetical situations. And so now we have all these potential areas of conflict and conversation. They can think about their own thinking and feelings. They can take their own thoughts and think about them. It's called metacognition. But it also can lead to something we call rumination, which what we see between childhood and adolescence is a jump in depression. And this is one of the factors that contributes to that. Now they can start thinking about their own thoughts. And if something negative happens, they think about it over and over and over again. A third grader won't do that as much but a 14, 15 year old will, okay? And so that's where we as parents may have to step in and help them to change their thinking or to distract them thinking about something else. But they also have difficulties in reasoning in really highly emotional situations. They, their ability to assess risk and consequences isn't fully developed. That's not gonna happen until early adulthood. They're gonna be more impulsive. Sometimes as a parent, have you ever asked the question, why did you do that to your adolescent? And they're like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's because they really don't. They just acted impulsively. That emotional part of the brain that develops earlier short-circuited the thinking part of the brain. And so they, they sometimes don't know why they did something. And they also have more difficulty managing social pressure. So when their peers want to do something, their peers find something exciting, it's more challenging for them to deal with. Again, because that reward part of the brain is working. And peers' brain, kids, adolescents' brains, really light up when they're with their peers. That reward part of the brain, when they're in activities with their peers, just lights up like a Christmas tree. It's oriented towards their peer relationships, kind of a natural developmental phenomenon. 
So what can we do as parents? One, learn to listen to your kids. Listen to those arguments. You may disagree with them. Encourage active problem solving. When they encounter problems in their life, help them to use their new form of thinking. Help them to use that new logic. Help them to use that abstract conceptual knowledge to solve problems in their lives, as opposed to us always trying to find the solution for them. Help them to use that thinking. We also want to maintain rules and boundaries with our kids. And then lastly, we want to provide logical rationales for our rules and boundaries. We, when they were younger, we got away with because I said so. When they're adolescents, we need to provide a reason. Why do we have a curfew? With our daughters, the reason for a curfew was safety. It's a safety issue. We care about you, we care where you are, who you're with, what you're doing, and it's all about safety. Okay, okay last two areas, self-concept. There's changes in their self-concept. They think about their, themselves in more complicated ways. They can see that they have positive traits, negative traits, positive emotions, and negative emotions. And those things can exist at the same time with inside themselves. They're also searching for identity. They're beginning to search for who they are. Who am I in the world? Where do I fit in the world? What does God want me to do with my life? having a sense of identity, a sense of purpose in their lives. Um, we also have what's called the emergence of adolescent egocentrism. And this is this is invincibility feel, uh, fable, this feeling that they're immune to the laws of mortality and probability. Personal fable, they imagine their lives are kind of mythical or heroic. I'm going to find a cure for cancer someday. Um, and they also feel like they're on stage, that everybody's watching them. If they have a spot on their pants, if they have a new zit, then everybody's watching me. Everybody notices that. But the reality is everybody probably doesn't notice it. And if they do, it's not very long because everybody is thinking about what? Themselves. And as they move into later adolescence, early adulthood, they come to that realization. Everybody's thinking about themselves. Okay, I'm really not on stage as much as I feel that I am. The other thing is there's this increased need for autonomy to do things on their own, to take on more responsibility. So how do we deal with these changes? Provide and encourage opportunities for them to explore their identity, their talents, their gifts, and give them wisdom and guidance in that process. Help them and remind them that God is there to help them find out who they are, that God is there to provide a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. I want to read a section from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Lewis says, the more we get what we call ourselves out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. It's when I turn to Christ when I give myself to his personality, they first begin to have a real personality of my own. In the beginning, I said there were personalities in God. I will go one step farther. There are no real personalities anywhere else. Until you give up yourself to him, you will not find yourself. Sameness is found among the most natural of men, but not those who surrender to Christ. How monotonously alike are all those Great tyrants and conquerors, how gloriously different are the saints. Communicating to our kids, seek God's kingdom first, and all these things, including who you are, will be found in him. Okay, okay and then lastly, social relationships. What's happening there? There's a shift in the focus to peers, especially close friends. Kids are spending more time with their friends. They want to be with their friends. There's more reliance on their friends for social and emotional support. Okay. In middle school, we start to see the emergence of cliques, which are small groups of friends that hang around together of you know, anywhere from three to eight kids that do things together. In high school, we start to see the emergence of crowds, which are reputation-based, which we have jocks, cheerleaders, theater kids. And those, they don't necessarily hang around with those groups, but they may be put in those groups by their peers. Okay? Uh, we also have an increase in conflicts with parents. Now, 
Which of these dyads do you think there's more likely to be a conflict? Mothers and sons, mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, fathers and daughters. Yes, you got it right, Shannon, yes. Mothers and daughters. Find more conflicts between mothers and daughters than any other, any other pairs. Most conflicts are about everyday things. Curfews, hair, music, clothes. They can be more severe, but they tend to be kind of those ordinary things. And tends to be more conflicts earlier in adolescence and it begins to taper off later in adolescence. So if you have middle schoolers now and you have some conflicts and it's happening, there is hope, okay? There's hope later on. Attachment to parents still matters. Kids who are securely attached to their parents in adolescence have a close relationship with their parents, do better at school, they have closer friendships, they're less likely to use drugs, they're less likely to get pregnant out of marriage. So being close to their parents still has some some really huge advantages. So what can we do as parents? Allow time for our kids to be with peers. Monitor their peer relations, know who their friends are. We knew every one of our girls' friends, we had them over. For some of the girls, we were part of a second family. Know who their kids are, what they're doing. Learn to accept that youth are gonna to wanna to spend time with their peers. Encourage problem solving when they have conflicts and not always being wanting to jump in and solve for them. And be the parent. Don't try to be your child's best friend. They need you to be their parent in adolescence. They really do. I've seen parents who start dressing like their middle school kids, trying to be a part of that clique. It doesn't work. Our kids need us to be their parents. They need us to be in that parental role, even into adulthood. Our relationships may change, but they still need us to be the parent. Now, when we think about what is absolutely key to preparing for surviving, thriving, while my kid is in adolescence, it's the quality of our relationship with our children that's absolutely key. And that quality of that relationship begins in childhood. That work really begins before adolescence. But the quality of that relationship, how we relate to our kids, the communication, the attachment, the ongoing nature of our relationship with them is really what's really important and is what's going to get us through. So anyway, thank you, and we look forward to your questions. Okay. Join me in thank you, Dr. Joe Price. Thank you. Let's talk about that immediately, if we may, about... Uh, that quality of relationship. So what is the key to preparing for surviving and thriving while my adolescence is, my child is in adolescence? The quality of the parent-child relationship beginning in childhood. And, and I've asked you many questions over the years, personally, how you did so well with your children in developing still struggles. <laughs> oh yes, no, no, I understand. But could we talk about that? How sure. you and your precious bride, Sherry, how you were able to develop these quality relationships with your children early on, and you've talked a lot about it this evening. Could you possibly give us just some of sure. your own personal experiences? Sure. I know you're a clinician, a professor, and, and yet as a dad right. and as a husband, how did you all do that? What were some of those early on uh, relationship developments right. that, that you, you worked toward? Well, I think probably... What I find is key is number one is to communicate to your kids that you actually love them and mm. care for them and that it's unconditional love. That your love for them, our love for them, we tried to do the girls, isn't contingent on their behavior. Yes, we may not be happy with their behavior, but we are always going to love them. That's just who God is. And so we want to communicate that, whether it's physically, verbally, when the girls would go to sleep at night, I would reassure them, say, do you know how much I love you? And he'd go, as big as the world. And they'd go, no bigger than that. <laughs> and you can make little games out of that. <laughs> but even when they misbehave, and you may have to, to discipline them, is you're still afterwards assuring them that you love them. And that's really important. The other thing is important for parents to do is to play with their kids when they're little and to have experiences where they have fun with them. So preschool, playing with them, elementary school, games with rules, being a part of their, their sports and being involved there, or music, showing an interest in their lives, and having experiences together as a family 
where you have fun together. For us, on Friday nights was movie night. And movie and pizza, just all the way through high school until they went into college. Uh, we always also on the weekends had either a morning or afternoon where it was family day or family time where we either went to the zoo, wild animal park, went for a hike. Even through middle school and high school, we had times where we spent with the girls uh, to develop those relationships and those relationship experiences. And then the other thing that we did is we had firm boundaries and guidelines. The girls knew what we believed, they knew what our rules were, and they knew that we were firm in those. We weren't pushovers. That when we said talking respectfully to each other, to your parents, we meant it. Uh, I can't tell you how many times Sherry and I would say to them, could you try that again? <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, they remember those words. Can you try that again in terms of how you say something, how you ask them? So those are some things that I think are absolutely key to that relationship. So you, you have a child that is behaving in a way that's not appreciated or accepted or within the boundaries of your family, and you talk about their behavior and you still love them, although you don't like the behavior. That's right. What language do you use when you're seeing that, especially if you're getting a little bit of frustration arising because of that behavior. You can say, you know, when you do that, I get frustrated. Um, I don't like it when you do that. Uh, and there's consequences for it. And you give those consequences. But afterwards, you say, you know, even though you got this consequence, I still love you. And I still care about you. And part of the reason that you had a consequence is because I do love you. And I want you to understand that your behavior has consequences. Um, and when you hit your sister and you were put in time out, that was to remind you to care about other people. And we care about you. So you're build building all the way along. You're, you're building character into yes. the child by separating a behavior from that you love the child. From the person. From yes. the person, right? Absolutely. So that they're not connecting that my behavior, I must be a bad person because I'm always getting in trouble for what I'm doing. That's right. It's maybe I just need to change my behavior. But early on in the development, even the, the frontal cortex is not registering that. So you have to openly share that. Absolutely. You know, we, we shouldn't hit our sister, and yet I still love you. And, and, and talking in terms of their development at that particular age. Yes, and, and it can be very simple as, you know, they've hit their sister, they're in timeout, or whatever the consequence is, and then afterwards, it's over, and once the consequence is over, it's over. Hmm. We're not bringing it up and reminding them over and over again, and then we say, would you like to play? Would you like to play with your sister again? Would you like to do a puzzle with me? So it's, it's demonstrating to them that my words that I still love you are really real. My behavior is saying, I really do love you. I really do want to interact with you still. That situation has been dealt with, it's in the past, and we're moving on. And that's exactly what God does with us. Mm -hmm. So that really that's the art of forgiveness. You know, when really God has told us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness as though it never happened. That's right. And so what I hear you saying, Dr. Joe Price, is that one of the issues is how do we as a parent manage our own emotion? When we don't like the behavior of a child, that what can happen is we can become upset. It may trigger something within us. We call that counter-transference in therapy where somebody's saying something in session and it triggers something within me. So a child, we can trigger a fear that if they keep up this behavior, what will they be like five years from right. now. And so it's how we can calm ourselves when someone, the child, is behaving in a certain way, correct? Right. Oh, absolutely. Because that's how you can then say, well, should we play this other game or should we do this? So that, how would you advise a parent that's becoming upset and anxious about a child's behavior and therefore needing to calm him or herself down so they could immediately say, do you want to continue to play with your sister? You know, have playtime, or shall we do something fun without, I mean, without that anxiety right. being there? Well, I think it's okay for parents to give themselves time out. 
Okay. Um, uh, Sherry did it. I've done it. We've told our foster parents to do it. If you feel like you're getting out of control, mm -hmm. that you can't deal with that situation, you're afraid of what you're going to say, you may say to the, you may go ahead and say, "All right, you're in timeout," um, and then you go into another part of the house, count, pray, get yourself back calm again. The neat thing about the way our brains work is if we can think about something else, think about God's love for us, think about another situation, a task that we can do, our brains are going to help us calm down. Uh, it's when we keep thinking about it that it kind of keeps us riled up. So if we can go into another room, think about something else, pray, calm back down, come back in, and then talk about it with our kids, we're less likely to say something that we wish we hadn't later on. So it's okay for us to say, and I remember Sherry one time with the girl said, all right, you guys stay here, and I'm going to say something I probably don't want to, so I'm going in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> and she came back out after a few minutes and talked with them and dealt with the situation in a calm way. And they sat there. They waited, and they are like, oh, my gosh, okay. <laughs> So that was modeling. Yes, it was You know, it's modeling. the old adage, who you are, speak so loudly, I That's can't right. hear what you're saying. That's she was modeling how to calm herself, yes. and hopefully the child would learn ways to calm Absolutely. him or herself. Just one other question before we dive into some of the yeah. questions here this evening, is there, there's been that old statement uh, about quantity time versus quality time. We've heard this, you've talked about it with your students in many forums, I know you have. Dr. Price, help us to understand what you said earlier that early on, if at all possible, spending time in playing with an early development child and how important that is. How important is play for child development? Play is, is actually critical. It helps in terms of language development, social development, helps in terms of cognitive development, helps in terms of development of the imagination, also, and it also facilitates relationships. If you want to connect with a preschool kid or elementary school kid, just play with them, and you're going to make a connection with them, doing something that they enjoy doing. In terms of how much time, um, that's, always, that's always hard to say, but what you want to do is have some committed, you may need to schedule time. You may need to schedule 15, 20 minutes, a half hour to be with your kids. We schedule for everything else, guys. We really do. We schedule for our friends. We schedule for other things in our lives. We may have to, if we're so busy, we may have to schedule and say, all right, I am going to be with Eddie at this time. And uh, this is gonna be the time that I have with my kids. I'm gonna set my cell phone away, I am gonna turn off the TV, and I am gonna commit this time to my kids and do that. We do it for other things. And so sometimes our lives are so busy, we need to do that with our kids as well. And it's important that we have blocks of time, you know, 15, 20 minutes to really engage preschoolers um, in play. Sometimes a half hour to play a board game with an elementary school kid to really do that, as opposed to five minutes, 10 minutes here and there, and it's just kind of hit and miss. We need those kinds of extended periods where we can get into the fantasy play with our preschoolers, where we can really get into the game we're playing with our elementary school kids, where with our adolescents, they want to show us something they're learning at school. We set aside a half hour to learn about what they're learning about in school or to play maybe a fun video game that they've learned. You go, teach me how to play this. You know, try that with your adolescents sometime. They have a game that you think is fine, and you think, I want to connect with them, is, is sit down and say, show me how to play this. This looks really cool. And then allow the time that's necessary to learn it, and you're going to win over them in terms of them feeling that you really care about their lives. What happens if you never really learn the game very well? My son would just kill me in video games, especially sports games, and he would make fun of me and have a great time humiliating me. But... Uh, you have any ideas there? Just yeah, just just uh, suck it up, suck it up, and go through it. it. Okay, right. and 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 just let him have a great time. Yes. That's good for you, Doc. It was really good for me. I'm just a better person. I had to I had to go to therapy Absolutely. for it for quite some time, but I really recovered well. You can see it here this evening. But all right. So if we can, thank you. That's very helpful. We may come back to some of that. Here's a question from the audience, and that is, uh, can you give advice on how to handle a situation when your child? 
this is probably an older child, an adolescence, of course, is when your child is attracted to someone who you know is not good for them. <laughs> this, is, this is the age-old question. It's a really powerful question, a difficult one. Uh, depending upon the age, of course, you will handle this differently. Could we look at maybe three different development ages and say, how would you handle it? Can you give advice on how to handle a situation when your child is attracted to someone who you know is not good for them? Well, um, we had that situation um, several times come up. And one of the things that we can be for our kids, particularly when they're younger, preschool, elementary age, is an arranger. Mm -hmm. And so we can arrange for our kids to be with kids that we prefer them to be with and arrange for them not to be with those kids we don't want them to be around. Gee, we ran out of time. Can't go over Eddie's or Bobby's. <laughs> um, and, and arranging, you know, if there's a child, you find that, oh, here's little Maria. She is wonderful. I want my daughter to really get to know her. My daughter seems to like her. Arrange time to be with her. Plan activities to be with her. Meet her family. Get them engaged. So we can do that through engagement and planning. Now, in adolescence, you may have to sit down with them and say, I don't think this is somebody who's good for you. And in fact, one of our girls I had to do that with and say, this is not somebody I really prefer you to be around. Um, and we're not going to make an effort for you to be around that person. Um, we're not going to we're not going to facilitate that. Um, what if the child with it? What if the child re reacts and says, well, I, I'm going to be with that other person, whether you like it or not? <laughs> well, um, you can have consequences for them disobeying you. I mean, if you, if you say no, you're not, and they go ahead behind your back, then you can have consequences mm -hmm. to deal with them. You, you once said to me, which I, it stayed with me, and I used to, I've tried to give you credit when I say it, and that is to be a predictable parent. That was the term you shared with me, be a predictable parent. You, you alluded to it, or actually spoke about it earlier in your presentation this evening. Could you speak to that? So say you have a child that is trying to push the boundaries with you, which Healthy boundaries create safety and actually lower anxiety, typically. Right. Absolutely. So what about this predictability, a predictable parent, grandparent? We have many right. here who are grandparents that uh, are also challenged with that, perhaps. It's important for predictability in the sense that our kids know who we are. They know what our boundaries are. They know what our rules are. They know what our expectations are. And we're consistent with those. And it's that consistency, consistency in terms of our expectations for them, for ourselves, our rules, our boundaries, curfews. You know, let's take an example with curfews, that when they move into high school, middle school and high school, they have certain times that they have to be home, that we're consistent with that. We had one of our daughters who, once she started driving, she came home 15 minutes late, and she didn't call us. And we had this rule that if you know you're going to be late and you call us and let us know and explain why, okay. You know, if it's a reasonable explanation, then okay, that's fine. She didn't. So she came home 15 minutes late. And we said, you didn't call us. You didn't let us know. So the next time you're going out, you have to be home 15 minutes earlier. And she was like, she looked at us like, oh, you're serious about this, aren't you? And we're like, yep. <laughs> And so the next time, and it was like a night or two later, she had something she was doing with her friends. On her way out, we said, it's not 11 o'clock tonight, it's 1045. But they're not, it's 1045. It's predictable. Mom and dad are somebody, then I think of it this way. You're somebody they can count on. And what that does to kids, when we're predictable, when we're consistent, as Don mentioned, kids do this. They may not, they may not say it, they may not articulate it, mm -hmm. but having predictability in kids' lives brings a sense of security, emotional security. The world's a predictable place with my family. The broader world can be crazy, mm -hmm. but I know my mom and dad, curfews are serious. Talking respectfully to my siblings, to my grandparents, to my parents, they're serious, they're consistent. I know those boundaries. Mm -hmm. And it makes life safer for them. 
It really does. And if you can kind of remind yourself of that, that makes it easier for us to be consistent, is to say, I'm actually helping them to feel less anxious in the world. You know, that's the beauty of the gospel. The Word of God talks about consistency with us, that He's faithful, that He is consistent. He is, in essence, predictable because of His love and grace. He never turns against His own character, so He's true to Himself. So this is, now it's not rigidity, it's not being rigid, this right. is what we're going to do and you're going to abide by that. Because you talked about neural pruning earlier and you said in neural pruning, 11 to 28 or 29, 11 years of age to 28 or 29, I believe you said this. Well, it's, it's pruning is until 11, 11 to about 18 or 19. And 18, oh, I put one extra, 18 or 19, excuse me, thank you for correcting me. And that is that the opportunities to learn, but you did say to provide structure, guidance, boundaries, and that you can be their brain during adolescence. I think those were your words. Okay, so the idea is that they need that structure, even though they'll push up against it, depending upon the age. But that predictability lowers the anxiety of the child because they can predict that there is something safe That's right. at home. Absolutely. Absolutely. And your point about God being that way, can we imagine if God was inconsistent, you know, mm -hmm. and, it, and if at one point he's like, oh, go ahead and do that. That's fine. The next time he really comes down hard on us, mm -hmm. we wouldn't trust him. Right. We wouldn't, we wouldn't love him. It would be hard to love somebody like that. And so the more consistent and predictable we are, and especially during adolescence, I think it's really, it's crucial at every time in development, but in adolescence, as they're starting to push boundaries, if we're there to say, no, these boundaries are still here, they still, they still apply, you still have to talk to me in a respectful way, you still have to treat your siblings in a respectful way and not hit them, it says, you're somebody I can depend on and trust. And you're somebody that I can rely on. Now, the flexibility. As kids grant, are gaining autonomy and wanting more autonomy, we can start expounding and expanding those boundaries. So in terms of curfew, it might be, and I remember one time with one of our daughters, we said on a weekend, as she got older, we said, okay, uh, midnight for Friday night, okay. We know who you're gonna be with, and they're like, Really? Yeah, you've demonstrated responsibility yeah. on prior occasions, so why not? And they're like, cool, that's great. And so by the time they reach 18 and they're going to college, we've allowed them, granted them more and more responsibility so that when they leave, we're like, okay, I feel like you can handle it now. And that's where we want them to be. We don't want to have to be so restrictive and not allow any autonomy that when they reach adulthood, they don't know how to handle uh, situations on their own. They don't know how to control their environment. They don't know how to control themselves. Yeah, because if we control people, we control children, we create anxiety because yeah. they have to depend on someone else yes. rather than their, their own autonomy yes. and their development. Yes. Um, for just a moment, let's talk about, if we can, um, another question that we... Uh, what are what are ways? Excuse me. Yes, excuse me. Here it is. What are ways that we as grandparents? So this is a question coming from a grandparent that can influence grandchildren who are being raised by two mothers from a same-sex relationship as they approach adolescence. So there are two females. They are raising the children and their grandparents are asking this question, what are the ways that we as grandparents can influence our grandchildren who are being raised by two moms from a same-sex relationship as they approach adolescence? The girl is age three, the boy is age one. So they're very young at this point, the children. So how could these, these grandparents influence in this? Well, um being consistent in their, in their own belief and their faith, um, loving their kids, I mean, loving those grandkids and being predictable to them. And so that when the kids are over at their house, this is, you know, this is grandmother and grandmother's and grandfather's house and here are rules, here are expectations and having those kinds of, that kind of consistency. 
as the kids get older and they move into adolescence and they may ask the grandparents about issues, the same sex issues, is for grandparents to be, to be honest and to, and to say when there's disagreement. Um, but to say, but I still love you and I still love them, but that, those are my beliefs. Um, but what's really important is that they love those grandkids and they treat them in a way that's consistent, they have their rules, their boundaries with those kids, um, and love them, um, and be the best grandparents that they can with them. Um, and, uh, you know, support those mothers to the extent that they can without necessarily affirming that lifestyle. Okay, yeah. yeah. So again, it goes back to really the, the words of Jesus. Uh, just extending love and compassion. That's an amazing gift when we truly extend love. And it may sound like a simple word, yet oftentimes I see in my clinic that people who haven't been loved, it's difficult for them to extend love. There are defenses and different reasons why they've been hurt, so it's therefore difficult to hurt, uh, to help someone else or love someone else. So I think it, it's always incumbent in all of our lives that we really receive God's, God's love. It's one of the reasons I'm, I'm not behind a pulpit, but I'm actually behind in a chair working with my precious uh, clients and patients, is that oftentimes I saw as a pastor that people would have proclivities from early non-attachment. You mentioned healthy attachment. And as they then grew up, it was difficult for them to attach to other people. Well, in other words, they couldn't even healthily attached to a mate because they never attached to a parent early on in development. And then what happens is they're not able to accept or inculcate or receive God's love. So there's something about the art of receiving God's love, but then being able to extend it to another person. Absolutely. Another question, this one came in on a text, if I may get to this question. What kind of advice could you offer for parents of a daughter who's going into middle school as a strong Christian. Also, at what age should we get rid of the phone? These are two very different oh, questions. Boy. Let's hold off on the phone one. That's a really, really good question. Uh, there's research done, and you can actually see the anxiety levels in a child that was given a phone at a certain age and a child that was given a phone at a different age. And depending upon the boundary set and the research, that they weren't not quite ready for that anxiety-producing phone and what that brings. Now, by the way, I've asked my university students, I don't know if you've ever asked this, but related to phones, I've asked them, how many of you have had a phantom text? And they, they're trying to think, phantom of the opera? What are you saying, Prof? What is the question you know? Phantom meaning where all of a sudden you thought you had a text, but there was no text. You, you, you thought it was somebody was texting you. All hands go up. And it's always fun to watch because they have a little bit of anxiety anticipating the next text. And so phones can create quite a bit of text. Let's hold off on that particular question. May we go to the first one that was raised here. What kind of advice would you give or could you offer for parents of a daughter who's going into middle school as a strong question? That is a great, great question uh, to ask. And I, I assume the question is the daughter is a strong Christian? That's what I'm understanding okay. the question. Okay. Okay. So this was, to me, I don't have the name, but the text came in like that in the question. You know, what I think is, is important for parents to do particularly as kids are moving into, into middle school and high school, is to help them integrate their faith into their life. And we do that by demonstrating how we do that, is how do we invite God into every aspect of our lives? I used to talk with the girls at, at night. We'd have Bible story, prayer time, and then what I called story story, where I'd just make up stories and tell them. But during Bible story and story story, I would talk about how I've asked God to help me with my research. And say, you know, I'm trying to think what I'm going to do next, but I'm going to ask God to help me. Hmm. Or my teaching. Or uh, a situation I'm dealing with a student. Is to show them how I'm inviting God to be a part of every aspect of my life. Hmm. And it's really important that we as parents demonstrate that to our kids to help them to see, particularly as they're moving into middle school, God cares about what you learn. God cares about your peer relationships. God cares about what's happening to your body. 
God cares about every aspect of your life. You can talk with him about it. You can ask for wisdom in every part of your life. He wants to be a part of your life. And so we as parents need to demonstrate how we do that. And we can do that during prayer time at, at the table, at bedtime or whatever. Talk about, you know, when we're in the car and how God has helped us do this and that. And mm -hmm. how God is a part of our lives. And then help them to see how God can be a part of every part of their life. Um, and whatever it is. And let me give you an example. One of our daughters came home from school one day and she had been... Um, threatened by another kid. Something had happened during gym time. They were supposed to do a game. Uh, this other girl didn't want to participate. The gym teacher came over and said, what's going on? And Kylie said, well, she doesn't want to participate. This girl got mad at Kylie after school. She showed up with some of her friends and were going to beat Kylie up. Kylie's friend went and told the principal. The principal came over and these girls got in trouble. But then Kylie came home and you know, told us what happened. Well, one of the things we did was pray about it. God, give us the wisdom mm -hmm. of what to do. Mm -hmm. Help us, us being Kylie and I and, and Sherry, to mm -hmm. deal with this situation. And then we help Kylie problem solve and think about, well, what is it you can do? How would you react to her tomorrow if you see her? Mm -hmm. If you see her, say hi. You know? You don't, you don't need to ignore her, just say hi, just be friendly, mm -hmm. you know? And she was nervous. She was clearly nervous that next day. But Sherry prayed with her, invited God to be a part of that situation. God's here. God loves you. God cares about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Within a day or two, that girl had been, had been expelled for a couple of days. When she came back to class, mm -hmm. it was a group discussion. Kylie was leading the group discussion. This girl raised her hand. Kylie... Uh, pointed to her and said yes, and the girl made a comment. And then afterwards, a girl came up and said, why did you pick me? And Kylie said, because you raised your hand. That was the end of it. Mm -hmm. That was the end of the situation. And it worked out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, see, God's a part of your life. God cares about what's going mm -hmm. on. And this was a daughter who just recently got her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. Mm -hmm. And the other day she said now, and I just saw her, I just came from there and she showed me her degree and she says, now I have to do something with it. And I said to her, meaning I have to find a job to use it. And I said, God didn't bring you this far to have you work in Starbucks the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she smiled and she says, you're right. Mm -hmm. God's a part of her life. God's integrated into her life. That is beautiful. That, that really is about attachment, isn't it? That really attachment is that we can trust, put our trust in God, that he's going to be there with us, work, us, work with us on something and help us through whatever it may be, which is good parenting in a way. If you... It is. And one of the things I would talk with my daughters about, I grew up in a foster home, and some of you knew that. I would talk about that experience with them. And I would talk about how real God was for me as a five-year-old, being scared about who, where I was going to end up and was I going to be with my real parents or my foster parents. And laying in bed at night, and I remember telling a girl several times, I felt God was there. Hmm. And he took care of me. And I'd given them examples of how God took care of me. And then finally, when I started doing research with kids in foster care, I said, look what God's done with my life. Hmm. I grew up in a foster home, and now God's giving me the opportunity to help foster parents with their kids. Hmm. And so I was demonstrating and showing to them, God's a part of my life. God hmm. has been there ever since I was a kid. He's still there now. He's going to be a part of your life if you let him in, if you let him be a part of your life. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful testimony. Your, your kid, yes, there are, we're clapping for that, yes. That's a wonderful testimony, and you, your children are very blessed to have you as their father, obviously, the wisdom that you bring. Oh, we're blessed to have them. <laughs> yes, well, you can see that humility within you. Related to, to all of this, um, if we could just go back to the, the idea of the phone. Could we go back sure. to that, oh, that yeah, concept? Yeah. Because that's a great question that, that parents are asking now because the phones are available. And as you know, iPads are being passed out to distribute it early on. It's, it's a way to market them, you know, give them free to the, you know, like the schools or, or even universities, I guess. And, 
but early on development. At what point, even more so than a, a phone necessarily, at what point should a child have exposure to media and those influences? That's a major question. Oh, man. Could yeah. we start with the phone, though? If having their own phone, because it gives us security as parents, knowing that, you know, that our child, we can, we can watch them, we can track them, we can know exactly where they're at. Um, as long as they don't leave the phone in the bathroom and then go someplace else, and then they come back and get the phone, you know, trying to trick you a little bit. But um, what are your thoughts about that in, in your research and all? Well, I think with phones especially, you can do it in transitions. That they don't have to start with a smartphone. Mm -hmm. You know, they start with just the very simple phone. You just use it to call. <laughs> And then they can move to one where you can text. And then eventually, when they're in high school, they can move to a smartphone. And so you can gradually introduce it in stages that, OK, here's a phone. Uh, have it on your person so that if there's an emergency at school or something, you can call. But it's not a smartphone. Okay? So you don't have to worry about them you know, playing games on it or you know, going off on the internet somewhere they're not supposed to be. Is to introduce it gradually. Hmm. Um, so, and I think what age, it depends on the kids. Some kids can handle it, late elementary, middle school. Some kids may need to wait a little bit longer, just depending on the child. Uh, and then your own family situation. I think you need to assess your own family situation. Does my child need a phone? Do, is our family life such that it's a good idea for them to have a phone at this time? That's something is, that parents need to sit down and talk about mm -hmm. and, and say, is this something that's wise at this time with my kid? And if we're going to do that, then let's start with the very simplest phone first. And then when they demonstrate responsibility, you can kind of upgrade mm -hmm. <laughs> as they move along. Technology is integrated into classrooms now. Mm -hmm. Tablets are into preschools, mm -hmm. kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So it's just technology. It's just part of our kids' worlds, um, and so they're used to the technology. They know how to use it. They're chomping at the bit to use it um, because they can and they know how. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, particularly when it comes to phones, parents can say, "Okay, we're going to do this in a gradual. We're going to phase this in." And we're going to do it in a way that kind of makes sense. And as kids are moving into middle school, I think that kind of is a time when it kind of makes sense. Because mm -hmm. there's lots of activities, and they're doing after-school things. And they're being at friends' houses. And it's nice to have that connection that you can call them or they can call you if they need to. Yeah. There's a lot of balancing. Because even, yeah. particularly middle school, you might have coaches that are saying, we're going to all text each other. You know, and it puts pressure on the yes, child. Yes, it does. Um, or you know, there's an assignment, and I have to be able right. to communicate with all of my friends or the That's people right. in the group. And so part of that, I think, is continuing to be a learner as a parent. Um, I'm one of the worst, so it took me a lot more time to learn how to work with these, even packages for putting up boundaries and various things. But spend time, even be the person who doesn't know, and I think you said it well. Could you show me how to use this? My, my son has said to me over and over, I, he's the one that's always made comments, Dad, could you believe, you know, when you see this, could you believe something like this would be even invented? Because you had, you know, you had uh, a little, uh, well, you, you had a play phone, it was a can of, you know, Cheerios or whatever, and you had another one here, and you had a string attached. Could you imagine that this really worked and it was funny? Well, tell me about it. And so we'd, I'd learn a lot from, actually, my own children um, about things that I was not aware of, or take a class. Kids are teaching their parents how to use technology. Um, it's, to them, it's, it's a, a natural second language. Mm -hmm. For us as adults, we're having to learn that second language. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, our kids are the ones who are teaching us how to use it. Yeah. 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 And taking into account the circumstances, the school situation, and on all of that has to be taken into account in terms of when to introduce a phone, texting, and, and then yeah. eventually a smartphone. What I'd like to talk about, we have just a few minutes left, um, and I think we've, we've been able to get to most, of, if not all, of the questions here, is I, I wanted to talk just briefly, if we may, about attachment. Sure. So the importance, the importance of attachment for even young adult launching. So we have an adolescent that's moving into young adult launching, and we oftentimes talk about those who launch well are attached well. So they're connected to their parent. And oftentimes we think of adolescence or early development in adulthood as a time when we're kind of 
you know, moving them out of the house or moving them along. And that's probably a critical time of being available yes. and being, can, can we talk about that? Because many parents will go, my, my kids don't want me a part of who I am or what I'm doing. And we have two young adults in our life. And I just had a text from my daughter and talked to my son earlier. And we, I, I realized theoretically that this is, they're both young adults in college. And it's a critical time for them to stay heavily attached, not for me to control or tell them what to do. But if they're allowing me to give some direction, my son asked for some direction on a situation he's facing in his work this summer. And so help us a little bit with this idea of attachment. How do we stay connected but allow, but allow the child, or young adult for that matter, to be him or herself? Sure. Attachment develops through the quality of the relationship we have with our kids. So if we're talking to them, you know, we're, we're playing with them when they're little, we're doing all those kinds of things, we're having those boundaries, we're building that attachment relationship. Here's what, here's what demonstrates a secure attachment. When you, when you in, the, in the research, even with infants and young kids, kids are securely attached. One of the things that they do is they explore. Mm -hmm. They go off. They try new things. It's the insecurely attached kids who have a difficulty exploring, doing new things. The securely attached kids go off and explore, but here's what they do. They come back and touch base. Yes. They go off, and then they come back and touch base with mom and dad. Look, what I, look, look at this new toy. Look at this. And then they go off and play some more, and then they come back, look at this. Well, it's the same phenomena as you get into adolescence. They go off to school, they go off to sports, they come back, look what I did, look at this picture, look at what we did, come to my sports thing. They touch base, they go off, they explore. That exploration, that willingness to go off and do something on their own can be a sign of a secure attachment. Mm -hmm. Going off to college on their own and being on their own can be, and I have to assure parents, because I teach college students, that sometimes parents feel like, well, they were too anxious to move away. They were too anxious. They were too excited about moving away. They were too excited about going off to a new school somewhere away from us. And it's like, yeah, but they were secure in doing yes, that. Yes, yes. And but they're still they still call. They still text. Our kids text us every week, and we talk with them all the time. Mm -hmm. And and it's not us necessarily initiating. It's them. Like the other night, Nikki called to tell us about her backpacking camping trip with her middle school and high school kids. <laughs> she had to share that with us, and we just li listened and enjoyed it, <laughs> and it was fun. She was touching base, okay? And our kids will do that with us, but what that means is that we've established that relationship, mm -hmm. and we communicate to them, I'm here for you. Where we have to be careful is... What I see some parents doing nowadays is wanting to control their kids' lives still. Mm -hmm. Is as they move into adulthood, they still want them to be middle schoolers. And the parents still want to kind of control their kids' lives. Is now they're moving into adulthood. We need to release them. Be there, available, when they have questions, when they have concerns, when they need to be comforted. But not try to control them. So one of the ways you were saying that is that metacommunication. That's the term you used earlier, and that's thinking about thinking. So even early on, Dr. Foster Klein, medical doctor, Levin Logic, suggested, and there's other theorists that you're much more apprised of than I am, that would say, start early with the child. What do you think about this? Um, when, you, when you actually behave this way, what, what's happening? So the one way not to control even a young adult is to ask questions for them to think about their thinking. And I, you used communication earlier. So, so very helpful. I wish we could go on and on. We are a minute before we need to stop. So we could go on and on. This is such a great discussion. Can you see why we invited Dr. Joe Price here this evening? Would you join me in thanking Dr. Joe Price for being here this evening on adolescence? and his expertise. Thank you. Enjoy being with you guys. Thank you. Well, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed for this evening. Thank you so much for coming this evening to this event. This will be available online for you and other friends or family whom you may see as uh, sharing this with. So let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for Dr. Joe Price and his expertise and his humility. There's nothing more beautiful than actually seeing a renowned researcher, professor, 
uh, father, husband, who has a humility about him, even though he's tremendously thoughtful and an expert in his field. So bless him and bless us, Father. We thank you for your presence here this evening. You've guided us, and may we be able to think about thinking this metacognition. One of the great developments of the prefrontal cortex is to think about thinking, to reflect. That's to be human at the, the foremost, and that is to think about thinking. Metacommunication, as Dr. Joe Price helped us to see. So bless us now as we go, and we're so thankful for your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming to My Therapist Says.